Greetings. This is a meeting of Berkeley City Council's Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, December 14th, 2020. Uh, pursuant to Section 3 of Executive Order N2920, issued by Governor Newsom, this special meeting will be conducted through teleconference and Zoom video conference. This meeting is accessible online and by phone, and those directions are on the agenda for this budget and finance meeting. If a public participant wishes to remain anonymous, please click on the drop down menu and click rename. If you wish to comment during the public comment portion of the agenda, please use the raise hand icon on the screen. If you wish to comment by phone, please press star nine and wait to be recognized. Also, the committee has been informed that some council members who are not on the budget and finance committee may wish to attend this meeting remotely. Under the Brown Act, these members are permitted to attend the meeting as observers, but none of these council members may speak or participate in the deliberations in any way. I ask these members refrain from using the raise hand function in Zoom or otherwise attempting to address the committee during the meeting. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Okay, so let's move on to roll call. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Harrison. Here. Mayor Ergeen. Present. And Council Member Drosty. Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to public comment. Are there any speakers on matters that are not on the agenda today and within the purview of the Budget and Finance Committee? So are there any speakers uh, who want to speak on budget and finance uh, in the crowd today. So let's see. Um, okay, Alana, you are up to speak on non-agenda matters. Go right ahead, Alana. Thank you, thank you, um, council members. What I'd like to speak about today is the unhoused population in Berkeley and um, the need for housing, obviously for, for shelter for these folks and um, to buy, I really wanna encourage the budget and finance committee to consider buying a hotel or a motel and providing unconditional housing like in Finland when they started some years ago, housing first, which housing provided without conditions. They're the only country in the EU that homelessness is, is decreasing. And so I wanna urge you to have that as a priority to buy some hotels and motels in Berkeley and let's keep the folks who live on the street in Berkeley in Berkeley by putting them in hotels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, Kelly Hammergren, you are on. Um, just in follow up to that comment, um, since our parking lots are not being well used during this pandemic with cars, um, I think we should allow the unhoused uh, to shelter in the lots um, that have protection from the rain. And that's and thank you, April, for signing on before the nine o'clock hour. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to Becca Fink, you are on. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to say that I'm feeling pretty uh, upset about this uh, 5 million number in light of the unhoused situation. Um, and I think that until the audit is completed around community safety, that doesn't feel at all good. Uh, the Berkeley Community Safety Coalition put together a beautiful memorial yesterday for 21 known unhoused neighbors that died in 2020, some of them elders. Um, and we honored the people that have been supporting them and no one from the city council or the mayor attended, which I thought was really unfortunate. Um, there's a thousand people, over a thousand people on the street. It's raining, it's cold. Uh, they don't have tents. Um, there are several things that have been approved by the city council already, um, but not implemented. Outdoor emergency shelter and a sanctioned encampment, potable water stations, 25,000 from the Alameda County Funds for the Homeless, where is that? Parking permits for RVs and others living in their vehicles. You know, these are lives in the balance here in the city where our black community continues to shrink. This is the history of redlining in Berkeley is reprehensible. I've lived here for 40 of my 50 years. I was born and raised here. Um, when I was growing up, you know, I thought Beacon, uh, Berkeley was a beacon of justice, 
But today, instead of education, housing, mental health, we're giving more money to the police. And, you know, I'm not an abolitionist and I believe that, you know, police have their place in the community, but this is a travesty. You know, I personally worked hundreds of hours since June to be a stand for anti-racism and mental health. I got called in through this process of what's going with George Floyd and everything. And I want my tax money to be used to care for the people in my city. And I really, I demand that the government keeps its word and take action like now. And I think you're gonna start seeing people camping out in front of your houses, city council, if we don't do something about it. I'll, I'm gonna get in a tent and put myself out in front of your house, you know, until we do something about this. We've already approved them. So that's what I wanna say, it's really Thank important. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, moving on to uh, Maveen O'Connor. You are allowed to speak on non-agenda matters related to budget and finance. You're up. Good morning. My name is Maeve O'Connor. I'm a Berkeley resident. Yeah, I want to urge you not to approve the 5 million in additional overtime submitted by the Berkeley Police Department. That is, please do not approve that. Our community process that will begin in January, reimagining public safety in Berkeley, should not support the huge budget that is allotted to the police department in Berkeley. These funds take away from much more important community needs. At present, the lack of accountability and, mismanage and mismanagement of the department calls for much more accountability than we presently allot for. On the, I just wanna say one more thing, this is not necessarily, connected to the overtime that they are constantly requesting every year. But on October 5th, early morning, a group of activists were trying to protect our public commons and the police and very nonviolently, of course, direct action. The police were paid, according to the police department, they told us this, were paid by AT&T to come and remove us from, um, our protection effort. So in other words, AT&T is using our police to do their dirty work and we are supporting that. And if you didn't directly support it, then your police chief did along with the city manager. So that's called mismanagement in my book to use the police that way. Whether they were paid out of their overtime or directly by AT&T, I am not sure, but I think that needs to be looked into. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, a reminder that this is on non-agenda matters. So if you have um, a public comment around police overtime, we'll be discussing that during our agenda. Uh, so if you have a comment on non-agenda matters, uh, please raise your hand at this time as they pertain to budget and finance. Russell Bates, you're on. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, Saturday from People's Park. Russell, Russell, will you unmute yourself? Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Start, start over, Russell. Can we okay. reset the clock, please? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Uh, Saturday from People's Park, two of us were there uh, as part of the two hour, two and a half hour program honoring people who have died on the streets of Berkeley, the unhoused people, as well as the people who support unhoused people on the street in Berkeley. When it came to Lisa's and I's turn to reading the 21 names of the people who had died on the streets. There were so many familiar faces and memories of people we had known. And there were tears in our eyes that were unstoppable throughout the whole thing, which brings me to the point of there needs to be housing found this year for people who are on the streets in Berkeley, permanent housing. Stop giving additional stories to the developers and gentrifiers to aid and abet the middle class and the upper class to move in. And 
put some energy into finding homes for the unhoused people. Call the ambassadors on Telegraph and Shattuck off from harassing unhoused people and taking extra parts that they determine are stolen or not the tent dwellers' uh, possessions. This needs to be done. And there's got to be a time limit put on it. Uh, politicians seem to promise a lot and deliver less so. Uh, it's time to step up and people are going to start demanding that you do more or else there's going to be retribution that could come in many different ways. These poor people must be helped. They must be aided and abetted in finding housing this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that's all uh, the hands that are raised for non-agenda matters. So, oh wait, hang on. Okay, um, it looks like Moni Law, uh, you are up to speak on uh, non-agenda matters. Uh, thank you, Council Member Drosty. Um, I, sorry for the lateness there of my hand. Um, I wanted to make sure that you have the letter that was sent to your staff to read for the record. And it's from the Berkeley Community Safety Coalition with regard to overtime requested by the uh, Berkeley Police Department to ensure that there's proper scrutiny, uh, the undergoing of the ongoing audit at this time and the reimagining process not being completed. Uh, would be appropriate and consistent to not approve additional overtime until those procedures are completed. So we're urging you to apply best practices as this is a budget and finance committee. We appreciate your thoroughness and diligence in ensuring that uh, that is properly reviewed and scrutinized very closely. So I, want, did, I wanted to clarify that you did indeed receive the letter, please, if you could confirm so, that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Oh, you did? Okay, you got it. Yep. Great. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, yes. So, so since the public comment was around receiving the letter, we did receive it. It'll be read into the record when we have um, our discussion on agendized items. Uh, right now is a commentary on uh, non-agenda items, and since that was about the letter, then that that's appropriate. Uh, but just to let everyone know, if uh, you want to comment on police overtime. Now is not the time to do so. It will be discussed um, during this budget uh, discussion later on. So thank you, Moni. All right, moving on to phone number uh, ending in 060. Uh, you're the last person. Non-agenda matters related to budget and finance. Go right ahead. Uh, hi, this is Carol Morosovic, and I'm following up on the previous uh, speaker in terms of the need of housing. And I'm, uh, we have to be deeply concerned that the people that are staying at the motels on University Avenue are about to be displaced. Uh, it appears that the county has not given the money to Berkeley, unless there's something that we haven't been advised of yet to keep those people in the motels. And it, we, this should be something that we should be taking care of. We need to stop taking our uh, unhoused persons who have a base in Berkeley, many of whom have grown up here or have long-term commitments uh, ties here and placing them outside our community uh, to the extent that the persons are being placed at all. Uh, uh, with the unhoused, they have lived with enough in their lives of being, uh, being displaced and they need security and stability within our community. We need to be taking care of these, the individuals here in two weeks they're about to be displaced once again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, that's it. So um, moving it back to the committee. Um, 
let's move on to the minutes from December 10th. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, clerk, will you please uh, call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Harrison. Yes. Mayor Erickson. Yes. And Councilmember Drosty. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, now moving on to action items. I'd like to hear items two and three together because frankly, uh, the reserves replenishment is also a budget conversation. So I think it makes sense to group two and three together. Um, and so I was wondering whether the city manager uh, has any additional presentations or comments on items two or three. Um, we'll defer to Teresa Berkeley Simmons. Um, if there's anything additional to add, um, we do have a, a quick presentation on overtime as a report back to the committee. Uh, good morning. We don't have any um, new information. We did document um, some of the requested items we 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 present we have included, um, such as um, for the unfunded liability. I'm sorry, for the unfunded needs, um, I think Council Member Harrison asked that we include the original request and, compa um, and compare it to the updated request. So we did update that spreadsheet. Um, and then we did provide some additional information on what the general fund reserves balance would look like um, at a 25% funded level. So that information um, was submitted in the reports, but there is um, no new information um, as far as the AAO detail um, and any additional unfunded needs. I do believe Dave um, has some updated information tied to police overtime um, that he can present. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Teresa, um, and good morning. Chair Jostey and members of the Budget and Finance Committee. So we submitted uh, to you towards the end of the day yesterday, um, a response to some of the requests that we had on Thursday, uh, specifically in the memorandum that is up on the website, we provided some additional detail on the capital improvement fund as a starting point, uh, documenting some of the ending fund balances um, and how those resources are deployed. Um, but most importantly, well, secondly, we also provided some additional information on uh, the police department, their overtime uh, budget, uh, the dollar amounts that they were over budget from fiscal year 16 to 20, and line that up with the department budget itself um, to help us understand how much uh, of that overage was uh, needed from other parts of the general fund. Um, the third part uh, where we spent uh, a good chunk of the weekend was trying to be responsive to the request around police department overtime. And so uh, what we did was we uh, looked specifically at uh, the hours by position and classification and really tried to use that as another methodology by which to develop a grounds up uh, estimate of what uh, need there might be for overtime. So I'll quickly take you through a, a brief presentation explaining uh, what we uh, provided to you. I um, mean, I'll pull it up right now. Do you see the presentation mode? Yes. Great. So um, this slide you've seen before, uh, this kind of walks through the analysis that we started um, a few weeks ago. Uh, what we have added is a new box here uh, where we have taken a deeper dive into the analysis of overtime hours by position. And that really does flow from the work that we did looking at a high level of the hours, uh, really at a higher level of sworn versus non-sworn. So this is a chart you've seen before. This just documents the overtime, what was budgeted versus uh, actual expenditures for the past 11 fiscal years, just to set the foundation. And then this is where we left off the analysis uh, last week, where we looked at the uh, sworn employees. We looked at their overtime by category. 
regular overtime, holiday training, vacation, and sick leave is that orange bar. And then showing a few of the other categories, special events, reimbursable services, and other. And so we took it to the next level and started to dive in by position. And so this first chart here uh, will show you really the overtime uh, for the various positions in which it is tracked. And this is, again, just focusing on the sworn uh, side of the house. So uh, police chief and police captains are at the very bottom. Uh, that overtime uh, from the captain seems to be driven by holiday pay. And then you've got the lieutenants, which is the gray bar, the sergeants, and then obviously, uh, given they're the largest component of the sworn staff, police officers are generating the majority of the hours uh, for overtime. So what we did was we went through uh, each one of the positions, focusing specifically on lieutenant sergeants and officers, and endeavor to understand um, how their overtime uh, is being allocated. Um, the chunk of it uh, that is sort of reg routinely reoccurring uh, revolves around the holiday training, vacation, and sick leave overtime hours, and that's the orange bar. And then you can see the blue bar is the regular overtime that uh, bounces around over the years, and then some of the other categories. When we looked at this historically, um, and that detail is uh, in the Excel spreadsheets that we provided to you, um, those hours for lieutenants are generally bouncing around the 5,000 hour level uh, over a five-year trend. And then we've got our sergeants, again, same analysis, doing the same type of work, um, really breaking out their overtime to understand it um, a little bit better by category. And then uh, where the majority of the hours are created is through our police officers. Um, and you can see uh, really the growth in the regular overtime component uh, is driving a lot of the increases in overtime uh, that they are experiencing as a position. So what we did with this data um, was uh, really a couple things. One, um, in the attachments or exhibits that we provided to you, we tried to use these hours uh, and this is really sort of a starting point for, I think, some additional work that we can do. But what we did was we took these hours for the various positions. And what we really wanted to see, because I appreciated Councilmember Harrison's comment um, at that last committee in terms of, you know, the averages and the historical piece is great, but, you know, it isn't really indicative of where current uh, hourly rates are. So we looked at these hours, we used the median hours for the various positions, we looked at the three-year average, we looked at the five-year average for hours, and what we tried to do was we applied the current hourly rates uh, for the various positions to those hours to see what kind of uh, overtime requirement that would generate. And so there's two uh, pieces of the analysis which are in the um, exhibits that were submitted as part of the memorandum. And this table really just is a high level summary of that. Um, and when we look at the hours for sworn employees, you know, it generates a range of about $5.3 million in need uh, for the, at the median number of hours, three-year average and five-year average go from about 5.9 to 5.4. Recognizing that this is only telling part of the story by looking at the swarm, we also brought in, uh, and this is not based on hours, so this is more based on averages for the communications and jail division, because we just wanted to, to get sort of a high level understanding of where this request fits in uh, to the bigger picture. So we tried to be somewhat conservative. We only took 90% of the overtime from the communications and jail division um, under the assumption that 10% of it uh, would fall under sworn. Um, that's high uh, because there are not that many sworn uh, employees actually assigned to these divisions. So there's a lot of refinement to uh, do there. But what you can see is for a year, in terms of an overtime requirement, that would range anywhere from a low of about 6.65 million to a high of about 7.3 million. And so then we backed out what had already been allocated, uh, the 1.76 million across the various columns to come up with an articulated uh, requirement ranging anywhere from 4.88 uh, to 5.54 million. So that concludes the presentation um, that we had just to update some of this work and we appreciate 
very much the questions that were asked because it helped us to really dig in a little bit deeper. And, and I think we've got a good foundation to build from. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa, back, back to you. Hi, okay. So I think um, that wraps it up for us and we're um, obviously open um, to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, I, I'm gonna pose this to my committee members. Uh, would you prefer to ask your questions now from staff and then go to public comment? Or um, should we go to public comment and then ask our questions and uh, provide our comments afterwards? Does anybody have a strong- I'd feeling? like to ask questions right now and then provide comments after, just so people can make sure they all understand the same okay. basis of where we're starting. And then uh, Madam Chair, I have a proposal, which at some point I'd like to present um, after the public comment. As, okay. as do I, I have a proposal as okay. well. Great. Um, so Council Member Harrison, why don't we go to the, um, your questions right now? Okay, okay. So uh, I have one, a couple questions for Teresa. When we're talking about the additional $5 million, what was the starting number in the budget that you added the 5 million to? So for the overtime, I believe yeah. it was 1.6 million. Okay. And actually, okay. if it specific okay. numbers, I'll actually need to confirm um, or actually have asked Chuck to confirm um, with the starting numbers. But I think you're saying as far as the adopted budget, correct? Yeah, or what did we adopt in the budget? I think it's 1.7, I think David may have just said. I just want to confirm. You're starting with 1.7 and then you're adding five. Let me uh, check. Can you confirm that, or Dave? Can you confirm that number, please? That's correct. It's the one seven five four that we've been showing in the PowerPoint um, Thursday and today. Okay. Um, I had a question about the um, non-sworn for a minute, David. The ninety percent in the communication center. I believe that they have seen a pretty hefty increase in staffing levels there. Can you tell me what their staffing is now versus the average over the last two years? I'll defer. I'll defer to the chief on that one. Um, if you've got that information, Andy. I don't have. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, members of the committee. I, I don't have that specific information. Um, I think um, the staffing has um, been an ongoing concern in the comm center, uh, getting somebody through the training program mm -hmm. solo. And I don't uh, believe it has uh, increased to the to the point of having solo uh, dispatchers. Um, uh, too significantly over the past few years. It's an ongoing struggle there, but I can find out. Yeah, I had, I had heard from the deputy city manager there's been an increase in staffing there recently. So in terms of hiring folks, getting folks yeah. hired and, tr and, and then they go through a training program, it can take, a, uh, uh, it can take quite some time, eight months to a year. Um, and so um, the folks that we have hired, not all have been able to complete the training. And when they're hired, they're not... Um, operating as a solo dispatcher. So although they show up in the picture of staffing, like how many employees do we have? They are not showing up in terms of how many um, individually working solo operators we have. Okay. okay, would it be fair to say that by the end of this fiscal year, they will be trained? Uh, I would be hesitant about that because of the difficulties are in training folks. In eight months, really? Okay. Um, then I had another question about the, um, I just want to make sure on reimbursables that I understood this correctly. We do not get reimbursed for mutual aid, right? When we support other cities. And I'm not complaining about that. I just want to make sure I understand the reimbursable dollars. Right. We don't reimburse for that. Okay. So wait, I'm sorry. So the oh, distinction okay. is, the nuance is, we may be reimbursed when it's a FEMA event, um, as uh, was the case in the Napa fires. Uh, in this fiscal year, earlier in this fiscal year. So we anticipate being reimbursed for that. Uh, we are not reimbursed for, um, I would say, typical law enforcement mutual aid. Um, okay. But there, so we may be, uh, if it's a FEMA reimbursable event, we're okay. very careful to make sure we've got all the paperwork, that we've got all uh, the contracting, okay. and, and then uh, we get reimbursed for that. And because it's coming from somebody else. But if we're just doing it on behalf of Oakland, mm -hmm we don't get, okay, that's fine. I'm not complaining. I'm just wanna make sure I get these numbers. Right, they, and, they come and help us, we go and help them. Yeah, that seems fair. 
So um, David and Teresa on the reimbursables, um, as I understand it, the reimbursables do not go back into the police department. They go into the general fund. Is that correct? That's correct. They go back into the general fund. Okay. So right now this year we're showing about $400,000 in reimbursables just through October, whereas we had 185,000 in 2019. So that additional money has gone into the general fund. That's and where's that shown in Henry's charts in terms of money? Where's it shown in terms of revenues? Um, I'll actually have to ask Henry. I'm assuming um, other income, but Henry would have to respond to that directly. Yeah, it's probably other, it's either in um, other revenues because some of them just come in or other income, but it's going to be other revenues. We have a section in our, that talks about other revenues. Um, if you look at that, I think it's the last, um, the third line before the end of the chart. So Can you put that up? Can you put the chart up? Sorry. Okay. Let me, let Thanks. Me see. Let me share my... Um, go right here no we have to make it bigger sorry i'm old <laughs> i can't read that okay got it so on your other revenues right here okay so in a sense when the department spends more money on reimbursable things and we give them general fund for that that money is right here correct if so we get, if we get any revenues look um, the revenues are divided into major revenues and none. This line item of six million has about five hundred items in there. Okay. So anything that is not big, that is not that is not major, is slumped into it, or else we'll okay. have pages. So that's where the other revenues are. Okay. So what I guess I would like, not obviously for today or tomorrow night, but I'd like as we have this ongoing discussion, I want to understand that better. I want to know how much money came into the revenue side. And then I'd like to discuss later why we don't show that in the police department budget. Because in a way, if they're doing a lot of reimbursable things, it's showing like they're spending all this extra money, but actually the money is over here, if you see what I mean. And it, it kind of shows like we're wasting money in the police department, we're spending a lot, but we're actually not spending as much more because the revenues are here. And I just find that I would prefer to see a revenue transfer line in the police department so that we can do that accounting and be clear and they're not told well this is you know you overspent or whatever because that's a big number that's four hundred thousand dollars for october that's twice what it was for the whole year in 19. so that's that's a factor i just feel like the accounting the way we do it masks that so that's something i'm going to be asking for in the in the future um and then i want to go back to mr white a couple questions on the patrol data and the issue of the um, averaging that you did. So the 20, just, and this is kind of a comment, but also a question. The 2020 number was really high. We saw that. The budget number was 7.6 million, way higher than the past years. And yet 20, if you look at your chart um, exhibit, I will get there, sorry. Exhibit uh, one from, which memo is this? From the memo you just gave us, your exhibit one from the memo you just sent us last night, David, shows that our staffing levels are higher than they were in 18 and 19. So we had an increase in overtime expenditures, even though our staffing levels are higher. I think using 20, which is a particularly high year, is a problem because something went awry in 20. We don't know what that was yet. We don't know why it was so much more. We don't have to talk about it right now, but it was not related to staffing levels. And that's where your numbers that you just gave us a minute ago, where you show how much came out of the police department and how much came out of other are so important because those numbers show us that in 18, this part was down in staffing and almost all the overtime was absorbed by them, except like $181,000 or something. In 20, they weren't as far down in staffing and almost all the overtime was absorbed by the general fund outside the police department. So. I just think the 20 year is not a good year to be using, and that makes your numbers a lot higher overall. So whenever you do that five-year average or that three-year average and you include 20, I don't, I sort of have an issue with that. So I just wanted to say that. Like, here's a really good example. And then I'll, I mean, so I just have a question for you about the averaging. For example, in 20, 
we had 10,000 more hours in the patrol division in regular overtime than we did in 18, 10,000. That's like five FTE times $135,000 times time and a half is a million bucks. So to me, there's something about that year and I'm just going to say I'm, I'm uncomfortable using it at all because the numbers are so way out of whack. I'm not saying anything, you know, that you did anything wrong in 20. I'm just saying 20 is not a normal year. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. It's just a year we had more normal staffing and yet we had way bigger overtime. Using a 7.6 number and throwing it into a three-year average really throws me off. Do you have any thoughts about that? No, no I, I appreciate it. And um, I think that uh, that comment is spot on, which is why, um, in the analysis, we brought in the concept of the median because that number, you know, drags down the hours that we model off of by a substantial amount. And so that really um, emanated from a conversation I was having with the chief because we were looking at 20. And, and what happened in 20 was there was a number of uh, really one time events. Um, and this is part of, I think, one of the follow up actions that the chief and I have talked a lot about, which is. Uh, making sure that we are uh, well coding overtime because I think that if we had done this absolutely uh, right, you would see the special event number would be a bit higher, um, but you would see the regular number would come down a little bit. Um, but I think to account for that concern about getting sort of blown out by the averages, we tried to do an analysis that that brought the average down. And we think in looking at that, um, the chief and I talked a little bit yesterday was. Uh, there are, um, when you take out some of that one time stuff, uh, we came up with a back of the envelope of probably backing out about 10,000 ish hours, um, okay. which sort of lined up with the median uh, calculation that we did. Right. So um, those are some initial thoughts, but, but I agree with you, the 20 is a bigger year. The 10,000 hours is, is what I got too, and that's about a million bucks, just so everybody knows that. I just wanted to point that out. And then the, the last thing I have a question about, I'm gonna go back to this issue of the lieutenants. Just so I'm totally clear, in your patrol, Chief, are the lieutenants the commander? Watch, the lieutenants are watch commander. Is that, so every patrol has a watch commander? There are two watch, watch commanders provide 20 hours of coverage a day, generally speaking. There's two watch commander okay. positions in the patrol layout. Okay, so why do they need overtime after uh, because that? Because if, if, a, if a lieutenant, the reason we fund that um, is that if a, uh, if a lieutenant's gone on vacation, I mean, let me step back. Lieutenant has overall responsibility for the entire city operations while they're on duty. And uh, if we were to not fund, if we were not to replace them when they're gone on vacation, if they're sick, whatever the reasons are that they're gone, uh, then we don't have <clears throat> we um, don't have the overall um, experienced command level responsibility with authority to run the whole city. So uh, that's why we that's why okay. we replace them when they're gone. The same concern about sergeants, making sure we have sergeant positions filled so that we have proper supervision on the street. Um, and a, a big piece of that for me is that our department is really a younger department. So if we have right now, say 105 uh, officers in our sworn, you know, we have sergeants, lieutenants, but if there's 105, 110 officers, something like 45 of them have less than four years of experience. So the department is transforming in terms of its experience and that lower level of experience, not to say they're not excellent officers and we hire really good people, we have good policies, but that lower level experience in my estimation, necessitates to make sure we maintain a strong level of street supervision and of a watch commander overseeing the entire city um, during the majority okay. of our working hours. Okay, and then if David, can you go back to your chart that shows uh, how by rank the overtime was used? Because I hear what you're saying about vacation fill-in. You know the chart I mean, the one you just put up in your PowerPoint? Get to, you want to see for the all you have broken down by types of overtime by position. And I did see vacation, but yep. I also saw 3,000 hours of regular overtime for lieutenants, which times one and a half times $200,000 is about $500,000 a year. So you see here on the lieutenants, where are they? They're the grayish box. This is the this yep. is the total. Where's the one that's got it by type of overtime? That That is right here. 
Okay, great. So you see this regular overtime? That's what I'm, I'm concerned about. So we can talk more about that later, but that was one reason why I just, so the public understands, we reserved money in the budget. We cut 600, well, we cut it. We cut $600,000 because it represented this blue bar. Okay. And I'm totally open to hearing why you need some of that, but you'll see is again, it grows and shrinks. And maybe that's when you're more understaffed, it grows because you have less fill in at the bottom in a way or less experience at the bottom. But anyway, I'm concerned with the blue part here. Okay. Right. And I think that, um, um, here in echo. So I think that one of the uh, things that we identified through this process. Uh, was the issue of how we're um, coding our overtime. And so I think in the blue, that 1301, um, I've initiated a review of all the fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 overtime. Oh, great. In order to determine um, if we've been properly coding, I suspect that um, a, a, uh, one of our overtime codes was routinely used when it should have, it should have been coded perhaps as special events, for example. Um, and so I think the, that, that number will shift around uh, and it will also just kind of reveal, you know, what lieutenants do in terms of we don't pay lieutenants not only for watch commander over time, but they're involved in um, any, um, any bear, uh, special response team operation. They're involved in the oversight of uh, special events uh, and in, in um, any demonstrations. We have multiple lieutenants working on, on the big demonstrations. So when we have big demonstrations, and or long for long periods of demonstrations or protests, um, there's gonna be more over more lieutenants over time uh, in there. And I wanna look at it to make sure we've coded it correctly so we really understand it. Okay, no, that's, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and the last thing, I just wanna make sure that I have the right understanding so the public understands this. We have three things where I think the department budget is, has been understated historically, okay? So for overtime. So just everybody knows, it's not like we didn't pay some of this 5 million in the past. We just paid it from somewhere else. What we did is we got through the year and then we went, oh darn, this $1.8 million number is terrible. It never made any sense. And we need to adjust and give them more money. So those three things are salary increases related to overtime. We know that the, that number never got increased. So you got raises in the department like everybody else did. And we never changed that number it stayed fixed. That's like $700,000. Then we have this extra million dollars in reimbursables, which is really concerning to me because I am, I'm worried again. And I said this the other day in the HR way that, you know, having people do a lot of other stuff takes them away from us. And I want them on Shattuck, frankly. So we have that. And then we just have generally, we've always been somewhat over and we always just took it from somewhere else. So I appreciate this effort to reconcile this but I wanna make sure that it's based on reasonable assumptions and that we're gonna manage this number. I don't wanna hear this next year is what I'm saying. If we fix this, I don't wanna hear next year, oh, well, we blew it, that number wasn't enough. Departments have to manage with these numbers. You've been doing what you've been doing and we're gonna be changing things in policing and all that. But they've been paying, we've been paying for it as a city. I don't want the citizens to think you suddenly spent an extra $5 million. I think you suddenly spent an extra million dollars and I think 20 was a weird year, but you didn't suddenly spend an extra $5 million. You've been spending that. We've just not been showing it. So I want to show it. I want to be honest and straightforward. And that's what I'm hoping we'll get to at the end of this conversation. So thank you. I, appreciate that. I, I, would, I would respectfully add one category to your calculus, which is mm -hmm. the holiday OT pay or holiday pay. Um, that we know that costs on the order of $550,000 a year. And that's, that's the holiday pay that's part of contract with um, our sworn and our, and our professional staff, our non-sworn personnel. And that has historically been underfunded in that line, it's 13 okay. So that's another important one to keep, to keep in mind. Um, off the top of my head, as, as you spoke, I appreciate you've included some really salient and important points to keep in mind. Uh, I would add to it the holiday pay, uh, okay. holiday pay piece. Yeah, but before we all get too happy, I'm gonna ask you to manage these numbers. <laughs> so just so you know, I, I think things should come down, but I do understand there are factors that mean you're not spending 5 million suddenly extra. I had to fix that before the public started talking, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for your questions and comments, Councilman Harrison. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to go now uh, to public comment. I, I think the, the mayor briefly had to step away and he's coming back. So I'm going to go to public comment. So I, I want to uh, let everyone know that we are combining items two and three, because if we're talking about the budget, we need to also talk about the general funds reserve replenishment. It's all the same thing. So um, I'll allow two minutes, uh, regardless of how many uh, speakers, because I'm combining the items. Um, so I'd like to now first to go to uh, the number ending in 060. I think that's Carol. Carol, uh, you are on. Um, thank you. Uh, and I actually had hoped that the letter from the Berkeley Community Safety Coalition would have been read before public comment so that some of the public comment could flow from that. Um, I was actually one of the very few people that abstained on that only because we wanted uh, our, a narrow exception, a very limited exception uh, for unanticipated uh, emergencies or natural disasters, but otherwise, um, had it not been that that uh, narrow exception would be left out, we would have all been unanimous in our support of the position in that letter. Uh, it has, has now been brought out, uh, there is an issue with holiday pay being a contractual obligation. So that's understandable how that would be uh, incorporated into the overtime budget. Uh, there may be some other provisions. However, we, I would hope that you, uh, the committee scrutinizes these, this budget very, very carefully um, and doesn't grant the full amount because we need to move ahead with the police reimagining even though it's going to be a prolonged process, it has to begin somewhere. And everything has to be looked at with a critical eye, every single uh, point in that budget so that you can cut back and so that um, there can be um, moving forward towards what was intended by the police reimagining process. Uh, we can't have this be a process that only comes from a momentum that will disappear in time. There has to be a long-term commitment to it, and you have to look very carefully where you can cut back in this budget. You, um, Your time is up. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to Alana, you are up. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Ilana Auerbach. And um, <clears throat> I just want to, I'm so curious, having um, had a background in business and finance myself, uh, working on Wall Street in the 90s, um, this is untenable for, 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 for an operation for over 11 years to go over budget over the overtime budget to run over for 11 years. And not only that, but it's increased according to you know, David's chart. Thank you so much, David White, for, for the, that information on the, those charts. It's increasing over the past 11 years. So this is astounding and points to an utter lack of accountability. From, from a, 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 a perspective of management and how to run an organization is completely unprofessional and irresponsible um, to have an increasing under budgeting of overtime. Who is accountable for this? What is the point of submitting a budget if the BPD always blows through it? I demand that we have a professional audit. And I know um, David and this, the, the um, city manager staff worked, I'm sure, a lot of hours over this weekend to at least assess what the data is that's coming in, but we really need a professional audit of the overtime that's submitted. Who is overseeing this? Is, is this overtime really needed? We need to, it's time to interrupt the pattern of the BPD's endless overtime requests. What is the plan for the future? I know Kate, you just mentioned that, thank you very much. We need to know 
that this is not going to happen again. I urge you that this the, the city is about to launch the reimagining community safety process and to green light several million dollars, whatever the amount is, in more BPD overtime will not show good faith to the community that this is going to be a really authentic process of truly reimagining community safety. So I urge you to not green light more overtime funds. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um... Let's go to Emily Raguso. You are on. Hey, thanks. I am just trying to catch up. I didn't get to see the meeting last week because I was off. But um, and I'm sorry if I missed it. But I didn't see the presentation from Mr. White on the December 14th list of the budget page. But maybe I just missed it. Um, so I'm just hoping that can be made available. And I also really appreciate sometimes I know like when BPD does their reports, they'll also include if they have bar charts, they'll also include charts that have the real numbers, because when it's a bar chart, you really can't see what those different colors represent. I mean, you can estimate it, but it would be nice to also be able to see what the real numbers are. And that's my only comment. Thank you all for all of your hard work. Thank you. Um, and, and I believe the presentation is on the website, the PowerPoint, and the numbers, I think, um, are listed. Well, anyway, what we, you, can, you can look at the presentation um, and, uh, and we can post uh, the, are we able to post the, the email today with, or the presentation today around um, police overtime as well with the updates? I'm sending that to April right now so she can post it. Okay, great, thank you. All righty, um, let's go to Kelly. Kelly, you are on. Um, I just have a question first before I comment because you said this was on number two and three. So is this where we also comment about the allocations of like money for the water intrusion, or are we just commenting on the police? No, you and can then if you water could intrusion as well. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so yes, I hope that we can include that in the budget now uh, while it's raining, that we look at the water intrusion uh, and that we also uh, budget for the increasing the municipal counts to 100%, um, the opting up and that I would hope that we could cover the uh, seismic analysis uh, because the GAL report only gave the two extremes of minimal um, seismic work to maximal and did not do damage control, which would preserve the buildings. And if we have the earthquake, have buildings that are repairable. And then to the police budget, um, I appreciate what David White has done in all of this analysis, but it doesn't get to the core of what is happening with the staffing. And it reminds me of the discussions that we used to have in grad school in, my, in the MBA program that I attended and graduated from. And that is the tactic of managers to continually overspend their budget and uh, to get their budget increased. Um, you know, there's some people who get budget, some managers who get budgets and they stay within their budgets. And then there's the other tactic of continually overspending. And this just feels like there is something really wrong at the core. And we need more than just reimagining how the police are used. It's what in heaven's name is going on with the staffing. And that little incident that I related that I saw over the week is like Thank with you. all the police at a meter maid crash. What in heaven's name is going on with staffing? Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. And, and I just wanna remind people, if you have any comments about the budget, now is the time to raise your hand. All right, so uh, Russell, you are up. Okay, uh, although economically I'm poor, my spirit is rich. Now that doesn't 
serve me well when my bank account is overdrawn. When I am overdrawn, I am penalized by the bank. And every time I'm overdrawn, I'm penalized by the bank. So with regards to the police overtime, when there's an overdrawn overtime, there should be some penalty for that, whether that's the reduction of overtime pay or something that's not being done now, obviously, because it's like, you're low on money, okay. Spend some more on police overtime. Forget about the unhoused people that could use that money for housing or any service that's not being provided for them right now. This is completely incorrect and wrong. I don't want to belabor the point. I could go on and on and rant and rave some more, but I'm not gonna. Uh, my point has been made. I hope you listen to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, Kathy, Kathy, you are on. Kathy. Hi, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, my name is Kathy Durbin and I'm with 350 East Bay. I think over the last two years, we've written three or four letters to the council supporting the um, moving towards 100% clean energy with uh, East Bay Community Energy. So I'm calling specifically today to support the budget measure or the budget item that would address um, the costs of up, opting up the city's account um, for municipal accounts and East Bay clean energy to 100% clean energy. So I hope you can see your way to doing that. I think it's an investment in helping the entire resident, all the residents of the city to understand how important it is to move in this direction and the city can set a good example and hopefully work, continue to work with the board of East Bay Community Energy to make this a stronger program within all the products that they offer throughout Alameda County. So thank you so much for all your work. Thank you. All right, uh, Moni, Moni, you are, oh, hang on Moni. Okay, you are on Moni. Thank you very much. Um, three things. I concur with uh, Russell about the urgent need for housing and in the spirit of Margie Wilkinson, I think the budget should certainly uh, ensure sufficient funding for housing. And I'm very concerned, actually I'm in between the, my coffee hour, <laughs> my day job, and there are a number of tenants being displaced and homeowners losing their housing due to COVID displacement. That has to be addressed as an urgent need. Secondly, I really appreciate the prior comment on clean energy, that's both fiscally wise as well as environmentally wise with regard to climate change. And Berkeley should be, of course, at the front of that movement as we have been in other movements around the country and throughout history. Third and final point, a question. Um, where do the encampment sweeps fall in the budget uh, presentation by Mr. White? I was at four different events. Um, one at 4.30 in the morning, a couple of them around two in the morning and another at 6 a.m. in front of Old City Hall and one at Adeline. And there were about 12 elderly homeless people being um, evicted from an encampment. There were 20 plus police officers at that early hour. There were public works employees and the things were being thrown into trucks and taken away, their personal belongings, I observed it. And Reverend Sally Heinemann was detained for trying to help a person get their equipment and their personal belongings. She was released after we yelled for free Reverend Sally um, and she did nothing wrong. Marsha Poole happened to rescue somebody's um, walker by going past the police tape, but there were 20 police officers, about a dozen of us witnesses from the community and a dozen disabled people. I don't understand why there would be 20 police officers. I did a public records act request. I never received a response asking how many hours were spent on these different sweeps. I believe there were 14 in total for um, housing or unhoused people being evicted from their space. Please get the answers to those questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Where does it fall? Special events or regular overtime? Thanks. Thank Okay, so that's all the hands I see raised. I'd like to ask the clerk to read uh, any written comments, please. Uh, 
Yes, we have one written comment. Uh, dear mayor and council members, the Berkeley Community Safety Coalition believes that the approval of additional Berkeley Police Department overtime before completion of a professional audit is improper and inconsistent with a commitment to the reimagining public safety process. We demand accountability for every dollar spent. Respectfully, the Berkeley Community Safety Coalition. Great, thank you, April. Um, all right. So, gosh, there's a lot to unpack here today. Um, so I am going to um, initially, I guess, uh, ask some questions as well. Um, and you know, I guess my first question is, um, you know, we have received uh, quite a bit of information, which I wanna thank staff for putting that forward. Um, and it's still unclear to me how we can square all of the operational asks. <clears throat> so, you know, we have the AAO spreadsheet uh, with a whole host of expenditures for basic city services. And I'm sure all of my colleagues have looked through that with a fine tooth comb. And, um, you know, after tons of back and forth with staff, it seems pretty clear to me in that, um, at least in the AAO spreadsheet, that there's not, there's not wiggle room to not do those items. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I've gone over it five times. So um, I wanna commend staff for really trying to focus on how they can deliver basic services um, and, uh, and, and try to be mindful of our fiscal challenges. In addition, to those needs um, outlined in that AO spreadsheet, there is a list of uh, basic needs. Sweet Pea, we good on screen? Okay, sorry, I have a little visitor here. <laughs> um, uh, I, pardon one second. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, in, in addition to um, that AO spreadsheet, uh, I want to just note that there are sixteen million dollars in essential, essentially, essentially essential services. So we have sixteen million dollars in um, asks for essentially operational needs for basic services and functioning of our city. On top of that sixteen million dollars, we need to replenish a portion of our reserves. Now I um, I see in the mayor's presentation, and we'll we'll get to that um, uh, so he can present his proposal. I see, um, and I want to thank him for taking my suggestion of maybe doing a a ramp up in the reserve replenishment um, instead of doing 25, 25, 25, 25, starting off with 20 percent reserve replenishment, going to 25, and then perhaps to 30 when we're on. Um, better financial ground. So even if, you know, it, whether we do 20% or 25% reserve replenishment, that is tacked on to that, that $16 million in operational needs, right? So we're looking at $18 million that we need to figure out how to deal with. Okay, so, um, and we need to do that and make sure our contracts are honored and that we address basic services and we can have we can have a conversation about that. So but missing in sort of the our previous conversations here at the budget committee is um, a pathway to address that all. Now I know that we've discussed here that we can take a holiday on the excess property transfer tax um, that transfer of around, what is it, nine, uh, $9.1 million, okay? We have the excess equity um, of, or no, I, the, we, we have the excess equity for 2.5 balance, and we can take a holiday on the pension, uh, the Section 115 trust, $4 million, okay. Even with that, we still, cannot square it. So I guess I guess my question would be to uh, David or to D is if if we cannot figure out how to 
how to address that gap when we're in the hole by millions of dollars. Um, and this isn't even, this is outside of uh, additional asks by council. How can we, how would you recommend that we reconcile this? So even with the, pen, even foregoing the pension, the 115 trust and that transfer of 9.1, we still have an issue. So I guess that would be my, my first question and how you recommend, how would you recommend that we address this? So Madam Chair, I, I just wanna chime in that I, I, I think what just process um, first, and that is having the mayor present his proposal um, because one of the things that we would recommend doing is, um, is taking that proposal and coming back up with the funding plan that would support. Um, there may be a few little nuances that we need to work out, but um, the staff would like more time with the proposal as we, we've just received it, of course, but we'd like more time with that so that we can address your question and just pulling it out right now and trying to say, here's what we would do. We need more time with it. So we, won't, we don't have an answer for you today, but we certainly believe that we'll be prepared and ready um, in using the mayor's proposal once he's presented it um, and taking that proposal and just digesting it some more and bringing it to council on 1215. Um, we do need time with it. So um, instead of going through right now without the mayor presenting his proposal, um, we'd like an opportunity to review it so that we can have answers for, for you. Um, and I, if Dave would like to to chime in on, you know, um, further maybe deliberating on what you've asked, um, I, I think our starting point is important. And if the starting point is the mayor's proposal, then that's what we will be working from. But if the starting point is point is not the mayor's proposal, then I think we would just be jumping in at a at a um, at a different place. So, um, Dave, if there's something more you'd like to add, go right ahead. No, I have nothing. To add. Thank you, Dee. Um, okay, I mean, it, 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 what I, I think the challenge that I've found is that um, usually with regard to th this, this gap in funding, um, what makes it easier for us to deliberate is that we have a staff recommendation in which to work off of. And so that's been sort of my my struggle through this process and 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 figuring out that. So, um, so that's you know I I these are these are sort of operational issues, um, and I don't know if this you know if if a lot of this is a policy decision, um, but it's not discretion. There are a lot of expenses that are not discretionary, in my opinion. Um, because we just need to make sure that our, our city is functioning. So I'm not sure how, how we go about it, but I guess uh, this is a, a good opportunity. Um, and I see your hand, Councilmember Harrison. I'm gonna ask the mayor to present his um, budget proposal and then we can uh, discuss that. So Mr. I mayor- just have a, I just have a procedural question with the city manager. Are you suggesting we not vote at the committee today? Is that what you're suggesting? I am suggesting that we, we not vote at the committee today because we're not ready to do so. You both have proposals and we need to have you all present those. And then we're able to, we're gonna to need to take those back and take some time with them. So that's our, our recommendation is that okay. we are, yeah, we, I mean, if there is a gap as the, um, as the chair has pointed out, um, there may need to be some reconciling. There are a few variations from what we've seen so far. So we know we need some time with it. And would that be like tomorrow morning or would that be just at the council meeting? I'm just trying to figure out our role at this moment. So you provided a proposal. Um, I, you both provided proposals. We need time to take a look at them. And I, I think you need to vote on which one that you want us to work on. I think that's important. If you want us to, if, okay. the, if, if this committee wants us to work on your proposal, we don't need to take two of them back and try and digest them both. We would really like for you to say which one you want us to work on so that okay. we can present this, close this gap that you're, Got you're speaking. Okay. Understood, but, but the, the staff presentation the other day did not close the gap. You didn't present correct. a balanced budget, is that correct? That's correct. 
Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, and, and that's and and um, and again, I want to acknowledge all the work that you've done. But this is that's why this process has been much more difficult for me. Even though the numbers, you know, the numbers in June were much greater, um, it's a, a lot more challenging to to figure out um, what uh, how we can address that gap because we are we're in the hole. So um, I appreciate that, you know, you're, that, that this is going to be a, um, that you're gonna take what we vote on today just in terms of what to consider and come back to us tomorrow because I am un, I'm unprepared to, to say how we're going to address um, this multi-million dollar need if I don't know. So um, Mr. Mayor, go, go right ahead. Well, sort of following up on that, you know, I, I, I did present a path to get us there. And um, we need to go over some of these line items in the AAO as to whether they could be um, deferred or rather um, uh, the, the fund source shifted out of the general fund to measure P or some other fund source, which would free up revenue in the, in the general fund. Um, that was the only way that I, I could conceivably find a way to balance um, the budget. And, you know, I will note this, this city manager and budget manager did present, uh, you know, spreadsheets um, showing that there was about two and a half million dollars in, in excess equity available after we allocate to the reserves, but that didn't account for the 15.9 million in, in unfunded resource needs. And um, some of these things are things that we just frankly can't defer. Um, their legal mandates or things that are important for, for city operations. And so we have to find a way to fund them. And um, it's been challenging to, to, to figure out that path. Um, and moreover, um, you know, we're, we're coming through the AO trying to find line items that could be reallocated. We've asked questions, we're waiting to get information. So this has been a challenge. This has been a challenging budget to, to, um, to put together. And I just want to thank staff for all their work and getting us getting us information. My office has asked many questions. Um, this committee has asked a lot of questions, and I think it will help us land in a direction tomorrow. So I'm going to share a screen if I can. April, am I able to share a screen? You should be able to as a panelist, Mayor, but I can make you a co-host if you can. OK, let me see if I can. Okay, yes, I can. Okay, um, so colleagues, um, this document was sent out this morning, and I apologize for the lateness of the submission, but you know, we've been pouring over these numbers for, for, for a couple weeks now, and waiting for information um, to help inform, you know, whether some of these recommendations are workable. Um, and so I'm just kind of kind of start from the top and work my way down. So we used um, the numbers in Teresa's excess equity sheet. Um, so if you add the UN balance, measure P, the city manager's proposed general fund encumbrances, and carry over another justice, meaning carry over in appropriations, that equals 36, um, 36 million, 124873 minus the 4126937, um, leaves us at the balance of about 4 million in available excess equity. Per our policy, 1.5 million will go to the reserves automatically, which leaves about an available excess equity balance of 2.5 million. I am proposing that we do um, suspend the budget policy around uh, an automatic transfer of um, excess property transfer tax above the baseline to the um, capital improvement fund, which would give us about one, 9.188555 to work with, which is really critical for us to be able to fund the various resource needs, which are about roughly 13 million um, in resource needs that the manager had identified. Um, we add the excess equity balance, and then there was something that was proposed in the, the memo from Liam Garland, dated November 12th, um, the public works balancing proposal um, for the parking fund. There was a, a, a suggestion here 
um, around the Elmwood lot. Um, and talk about staff evaluated closing a lot to save costs and offering limited monthly parking to boost revenue. Closing a lot is not an option. Offering some monthly parking potentially to merchants for employee parking would, would ultimately make very little impact to the greater fund deficit. There are 39 spaces available. So if 20 were available for monthly parking at 100 per month for December through June 2021, it would generate 14,000 in revenue. I think the idea of offering employee parking is something that we should consider to support those businesses in the Elmwood. And if, if it generates some additional revenue that we can credit back to the general fund, then I think it's worth exploring, but, but more so as, as a means to support the, the businesses there. But I would de defer to Council Member Drosty for, for her thoughts on that. Um, but I, wa I, I wanted to propose that because I thought that was a good suggestion that we should consider as to support our businesses over the next few months. Um, so, you know, so that leaves us around 11.6 available. Um, and then down, down the table, I'm proposing that we defer or shift, shift the fund source for some of the um, expenditures in the AAO, which would free up general fund revenue that could be reallocated to help balance the budget. Um, so going down, um, in terms of city manager resource needs, the FLSA labor settlement, we have to do that. The parking funds, operational needs, there's a projected deficit of 3.24 million, which we have to balance. Um, the cybersecurity for telecommuting, 819,000, that's priority, particularly given that such a significant portion of our um, employees are working remotely. Um, the projected fiscal 21 building purchases and maintenance deficit fund balance, that was, I thank staff for further refining the numbers and reducing that, that amount to 92,000. Um, the fire department compressor truck fires said that these line items are necessary and can't be deferred. Um, I do think it's critical that we do um, set aside some money to fill vacant fire department positions. Our fire department is facing a, a shortage in staffing due to people out on COVID leave as well as um, responding to a variety of, of calls. And it is really um, having a significant impact on the morale and the ability of the department to carry out these essential public safety functions. And so I think we should support that. Just like we are filling police positions, frankly. Um, uh, police overtime. I am proposing that um, for council consideration that we fund the full $5 million, but obviously we will have a discussion about that this afternoon and the council will decide what would be an appropriate amount. We have to fund some overtime. That's the reality. So the question is how much? And it would be irresponsible for us to not, to not put anything in additional overtime when we already know that there are costs that we've incurred um, and, um, and costs that we will be incurring in the future, future months, especially with limited staffing that we're experiencing at this time. I will say, however, that we do need better uh, reporting and tracking and accountability on the, on the use of overtime. And I hope that one outcome of this discussion um, is that we put in place a process by which we can um, monitor and help control overtime costs because I think, frankly, that um, to some degree it has not been effectively managed and that's resulted in some pretty significant um, um, uh, extra costs that the general fund has had to incur. Um, I, I'm proposing that we replenish the reserves um, for the 11 million that we took out in June at 20% of the excess property transfer tax rate, which is about 1,837,711. And then I'm, I'm including Councilor Harrison's proposal for the, the study of water intrusion and planning at Old City Hall in the Veterans Building at 100,000. So that equals 13, 13, 0.047607. Then, you know, in reviewing the, the list of council referrals and listening to my colleagues as to their, their priorities, um, I'm proposing only 376,000, it's not a lot of money, <laughs> out of the total budget um, in, um, in, in referrals and requests. The Bay Area Book Festival, this is something the council referred for consideration in June at 50,000. The UC Theater Concert Career Pathways Program at 50,000. Berkeley Mutual Aid, um, which is a really amazing program that provides support for, for people in our community during this pandemic at 36,000. 
the radar speed feedback sign at 20,000, the Berkeley age friendly continuum at um, 20,000. That's an ongoing appropriation that we've done for the past four, four years, I believe, um, which is leveraged with money from the private sector. The McGee Avenue Baptist Church Voices Against Violence program, which is a very important violence prevention program. And with the, the increase in shootings that we're seeing in Berkeley, I think this is something we should support. Um, PPE for family child care providers. My understanding is um, Council Member Hahn has submitted a request for 58,000 to provide uh, funding for personal protective equipment for family child care providers in Berkeley. That seems to be a, a, you know, a, an immediate need. Um, and then I am also proposing that we fund at 92,000 the additional cost of opting up our municipal account to East Bay Community Energy's Renewable 100 option. Um, and so that's the, that's, the ex, that's the extra amount we need to fully cover the cost of the 100% renewable cleanest option for, for, our, for our municipal operations. I think we need to demonstrate leadership um, in, in meeting the climate crisis. And I think this is one small thing we can do to do that. And that will also help us reduce our emissions as part of our climate action plan reporting. So that additional 376,000 results in a total expenditure need of 13,423,607. Okay. Um, so how are, we, how are we going to, we, we only have uh, 11,869,587 available. How are we gonna make up the, re the remaining amount? Um, I'm proposing several things. Um, in discussion with staff, um, the new property tax system upgrade can be deferred to AAO2, um, but this, the city will need to fund it at that time. So that is something staff has said could be deferred. Um, all these uh, expenditures on lines 49 through 54, I'm proposing that we shift to measure P. Um, and my understanding is that in um, there is, even after we've allocated money, there are still un, un, unexpended funds in measure P, including a, a positive fund balance. And so I guess I would like to ask a question, if I may, Madam Chair of Staff, around Measure P, because I think that's important for us to understand. Um, so we had set aside around 805,000 for um, COVID-19 um, sort of homeless emergency needs. In addition, um, there are things that there are, we approved a budget and we approved um, expenditures for specific things some of which have been appropriated through the AAO and some which haven't. So I guess I'd like to know what of those things that we had allocated, um, we had approved in a budget, what has actually been spent and what has not been spent? That's a great question. Oh, um, staff, can you? <laughs> Are you pausing there? Are you pausing there? You'd like us to respond at this time yes. or are you continuing on? Okay. If you could respond, so great. Thank you. Um, so Kelly Wallace is on the call um, and also Teresa. So I'd like to defer to Kelly Wallace for a moment and then Teresa can chime in as well. Thank you. And I'm gonna stop sharing screen in case you all need to share a screen. Sorry about that. I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> um, so the 800,000 that we were talking about is available. Um, we are not going to be using that for COVID response. We've used uh, specific COVID money for that. Um, we are looking at it and we'll possibly come back to you. We need additional money for the Old City Hall shelter. Um, with the new parameters, there is a base level of funding that we do that through the community agency process. So <clears throat> the last time we did that, it was a four year process. So there is a base level of funding for the um, interim shelter, intermittent shelter at Old City Hall with the expanded parameters and with us opening it at times for smoke and things like that. 
we are going to spend over what we had originally budgeted for that, but we don't have a figure yet until the season is over. Um, and what we usually do is try to cover that through other unspent funds. And if needed at the end of the year, we come back to ask for sort of replenishment of what we forwarded to DDH for what they've had to spend on that. Um, and the other thing is we will probably need more money for the shower program, the expanded shower program, as well as um, obviously the outdoor encampment. We may need more funds for, but the 805 as passed, we will not be spending this year. So that's available. And then Mr. Wallace, um, the 2.5 million in permanent housing subsidies, my understanding is that we have not spent we that. We have not, no. We're, we've been looking at different options, trying to figure out um, how much of that do we do, uh, looking going forward, making sure that it's sustainable. So we have not started spending any of that 2.5 million yet or made a commitment on a specific program to fund through that money. Okay, so even after, you know, looking at this, this table, which was included in a memo that we received on November 12th, just if committee members want to pull it up, but I have it here, even after all the expenditures that we had made for fiscal 21, there still is a positive balance at year, a projected positive balance at year end of um, $5.1 million. Um, Mr. Oikonmi, do we know yet what, how much has come in in the excess property transfer tax as authorized by Measure P for fiscal 21? Do we have, do we have actuals for the first quarter? Yeah, yeah, we do. Let me see. For transfer tax, Measure P, let's look at it. Measure P, Measure P, Measure P. Uh, measure P, we have actual 1.5 is what we have, 33% of the, so which is about 33% um, for the first quarter, that's what we got. Okay, I know last year was kind of an anomaly in that there was okay. a pretty significant, um, yeah. significant number of property sales. Yes. Yeah. Of, of, of large properties. That are sold. Yes. Um, so we're, we're at 33% and we're I guess I'm just trying to think of, so staff is projecting um, 4.7 million in revenues. Yes. Um, do you think we're on track to meet that? I think we are. Okay. Uh, we will, I think we are, but then we'll have to look at the numbers once the, once we close this December, then we'll come up with a better, better, we'll have a better sense where we should be once we have December closing. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. You know, I, I, I am, there's the 805 and then there's, you know, other expenditures, and let me pull up this sheet again. Um, you know, so that. There, um, yeah. Another one is the Life Long Street Medical Center. Um, we are in discussions with them about opening a trust center, as we had discussed, but that more than likely um, will not be fully operational by the end of this year. Certainly in January, over six months of that is savings. Um, so some of that, probably half of that would be available as well. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, of what can you, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Of what was uh, The Lifelong Medical Center Street Medicine. Um, as you recall, we originally had talked about sort of a two tier starting a partnership with them around street medicine and then moving towards a brick and mortar trust center like they have at the clinic. They secured funding through Alameda County for the street medicine portion of that. So we have moved directly into discussions with them around opening a trust center. Um, but, you know, it's already January, halfway through the year, um, and that hasn't happened. So I would say at least half of that would be available. If we can open it by the end of this, fiscal year, um, even though the operations won't be half, there will be startup costs. So I would say just to be safe, if we saved half of that money for say a quarter of operations plus startup costs, um, then I would say half of that is available. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, so, you know, 
there's that, there's uh, un unexpended funds, and then there's, there's gonna be a projected positive fund balance at the end of the year. Now I do wanna raise concern, however, about the future. And um, I, I don't think the budget at the, the Measure P budget is sustainable long-term. And we're gonna have to have a very, a very comprehensive and big discussion around how we're gonna fund the variety of services that the city needs to fund um, with the resources that we have um, and what is the most appropriate fund source for some of these things. Now, it may be that we need to look at what state or federal resources are available and we hope that there's more available under the new administration. Um, it may be that I, we, I, we need to go out to the private sector. Um, so I just think we have to look big picture because we can't support all the things on this list, the Measure P list, with the resource that we currently have available. That's just not sustainable. Um, and excuse me, Amir, I would just also point out for this year, we do have it supplemented, as you see at the top, by the million dollars in the permanent local yes. housing allocation, which speaks to what you're saying. Um, there is fund balance at the end, but part of that is due to the million dollars we put towards this stair center pathways project from the permanent local housing allocation this yeah. year. So that, you know, that frees up some money to go into the, in, into the measure P pot. Um, so, you know, in total, this is, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm asking that we consider funding these expenditures for this new homeless response team through measure P and the square one hotel vouchers would be a, 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 I think an appropriate expenditure for the two, 2.5 million the council had allocated for um, permanent housing, for housing subsidies. Um, but there is, there is sufficient funding in the Measure P budget to support these expenditures. Um, the waterfront security cameras at 60,000, um, I've been informed that um, staff have identified another fund source, but correct me if I'm wrong, to pay for that. Um, and then the electrical, the electrical work for the fire stations, my understanding is that part of the, part of this is the planning and then part of it is the actual work. And I am suggesting, and I would like to hear from the city manager or Mr. Ferris as to the feasibility of this, that it, is it possible for us to fund the whole project out of measure T1 rather than a portion of it out of general fund and a portion of it out of, um, uh, uh, or, or Mr. Garland, um, out of um, Measure T1. You know, usually we do some money out of T1 for planning and then for the capital. Um, can we do both? I know that we just approved the list, so we'd have to amend the list and, 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 I, and find 200,000 to support that project. But one of your staff have any thoughts about, about this particular line item? Uh, mayor and committee members, uh, Liam Garland, Public Works Director. Um, um, my initial understanding is that if the T1 phase two project list is indeed approved tomorrow night, uh, that that would take care of this electrical work. Uh, but I wanna um, uh, take a few moments to just make sure that's 100% true um, uh, to make sure that the uh, this, this committee and the council has accurate information before making a decision on that. Okay. Um, well, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get back to us about that. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and then we can come back to staff if they have any, any questions or comments about this proposal. So that, you know, if, assuming we can do all this, that results in about 1.7 million back, credited back to the general fund. Now there's a couple of other things that I had questions about and they're not in the proposal, but they're kind of like hanging out there as you know, other potential addbacks. Um, the illegal dumping, I know that some of the money in the homeless um, response team is, is supporting um, some of the illegal dumping worker and encampments, but I know that we need money for other illegal dumping mitigation that isn't associated with homeless encampments. Um, and then the rate stabilization fund, my understanding is that's a fund that was created for the purpose of balancing the parking garage um, and that 
the budget balancing proposal that staff had proposed is assuming 1.9 million that's going to go from that the, the balance into helping close the deficit in the parking funds so it didn't seem like that revenue was available but but please correct me if i'm wrong so even with all this we still are under by 14,000 but that's still pretty good considering that we were under by several million before we started this exercise. So, I, you know, I did the best I could, honestly, to try to get us closer to balancing. And I think the city manager's suggestion of, you know, forwarding this on for staff to review further and to come up with a more complete balancing proposal would be the appropriate course of action. Um, I don't know if staff has any further, anything they'd like to add around the... Uh, so. So, Mr. Mayor, um, I just want to just thank you for your, your time. I know this was a very difficult um, task, and we do appreciate all of the work that you've put into the proposal. Um, it is certainly um, something that we can work with. We would also like to hear the proposal presented from Council Member um, Harrison. We, we, do, we do need the committee today to land on one of these proposals so that we aren't working from two to present um, at the um, council meeting. So that's our ask today, is that we um, we have this committee vote on these two to get us moving forward. Um, but thank you so much for the work. It has, um, this has been a journey for us all and we certainly appreciate um, all of the work that you put forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garland, um, did, did staff any have any further information about the the electrical work for the fire stations? Um, yes, um, mostly just from my own brain catching up a little bit, uh, which is I think we've, um, we will have a challenge on timing, which means um, the money is needed for electrical upgrades um, that are time sensitive, meaning if we wait for the T1 approval, I see. Th those funds wouldn't come until April or so, which might delay the implementation of that project. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's not as clear as either in or out. It's a question of timing as well and the delay on, on implementing that project. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, one thing we could do is we can borrow this and pay it back through T1, right? I don't know. I, I, I defer to staff as to coming up with a creative solution. I'm just trying to find, you know, um, $750,000 or whatever is, you know, Actually, $730,000 to be, or 1.730 to be able to balance the budget. Um, and so that just seemed like something since we have, um, since this is, my understanding is going to be proposed the T1 budget, that it made sense to kind of wrap it all together as one complete project. But um, I, I guess I defer to staff as to, as to what would be the appropriate way to, to resolve this. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and then the rate stabilization fund, Mr. Garland, the, the, the proposal to balance the parking budget had, um, uh, I think 1.9 million from the rate stabilization fund to go towards that. I'm going to ask our, uh, administrative and fiscal, uh, manager, Sean O'Shea to weigh in on that. Looks like Sean might not be. Oh, he's on the other side. He's an attendee. So if April can, or uh, Chair Drossi, if you can activate his line. He's on the attendee side. Okay, he's on. He was there. You're a panelist. We're there. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, Liam, I'm sorry. I was kind of splitting between two meetings right there. Uh, so can you repeat that question? So, so Mr. Shea, um, I, I've been looking at various line items in the AAO um, and I'm trying to find money that we can credit back to the general fund to help us balance the budget. And I know that one of the things, one of the things that was sort of put forward is using the rate stabilization fund 
as a means to be able to balance the parking deficit, parking fund deficit. Um, I guess my question is, do we need, do we need all the 1.9 million to do that? Uh, we, we, we do, um, or at least that was um, the request that we made for the 3.2 million of the general fund assumed a full transfer of that 1.9 into the parking operation funds. Okay. So that request was already taking that full, full transfer into account. Okay. So that, that's off the table because we need to balance that budget. So um, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Harrison, do you want to present yours? Yeah, I actually didn't have, I, mine is all going to be about police overtime and I don't have anything written, but I have a couple questions for the mayor and I really appreciate this framework. I think it's very helpful. I'm a little concerned we didn't get a balanced budget from staff as that's legally required, but I'm glad to see we're heading towards balance. I'm not comfortable with leaving a balance of zero, basically, is what we're looking at. And so I will have some other comments about the overtime in a minute, but I had a couple questions, Mr. Mayor, if I might. Uh, one, I wanted to ask you about the, um, uh, sorry, the um, <sighs> PPE for childcare providers, which I'm very much in favor of. This may be a staff question. Is that reimbursable from FEMA or the CARES Act? We would need to we would need to follow up on that. I um, I like to follow up and see if we could apply a third party purchase uh, for FEMA. I'm not sure that we could, okay. but I'll ask. Okay, and great. Councilmember Harrison, in HHS, we're looking at our COVID funds to see if there's any way we can fund that through um, any of our current COVID funds. But I'm not positive yet, so I don't want to commit to it. But I do want okay. you to. We're looking to see if there's any way okay. we can do that through other funds. We know by tomorrow night on yes. that one? Oh, good. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Because uh, one of my concerns, and I had asked this question, and I appreciate Mr. White sending the table, it shows we received $16 million in CARES Act and, and FEMA reimbursement. Um, and I understand that we can't take existing staff and apply for those funds. We can't displace current staff costs. But we have $16 million of revenues that have come in and $16 million of expenses. And what I still don't understand is, aren't the $16 million of expenses shown in all of Teresa's numbers for expenses? And then when we get these revenues, shouldn't they be shown on Henry's revenue sheet? I feel like I don't understand the accounting. for, And these are large numbers. We took money out of our reserves in order to forward money because we had this crisis. Isn't it? international crisis. And I don't understand how this money is accounted for as it comes back in through grants. So can someone address that? Are the revenues shown on Henry's revenue receipts? And if not, where is the money sitting right now? The 16 million in your table. Mr. White? Did I lose you? Okay. Sorry, I was still jotting down those. Henry, I defer to you in terms of how you recognize, because none of those revenues are general fund revenues, except for the one piece that we got from the state um, where we yeah. uh, used 1.5 million to reimburse for some of our Berkeley relief fund work early in the year. But I, I defer to Henry to talk about how the all the other federal grants are recognized and where those show up. Okay, thank you. It all depends on, on where the revenues are supposed to be. If there are general fund revenues, they show up in the general fund revenue. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you speak louder? Uh, if there are general fund revenues, they all show up in my sheet. If they're not general fund, they're not here. They are in a different funding. So okay. If, so this is just general fund. So if the right. revenues are not recorded as general fund, it doesn't show up here in this so, sheet okay. that we have. But so if, where's the one and a half million that is general fund? It's if it if it's here, then it's in the other revenues. Okay, I, I guess I'm having a problem with this other revenue category because we're seeing that we're spending money on things like reimbursable expenses for the police department. And this, I really feel that needs more breakdown. And I'm gonna ask for the next budget cycle that we get more detail there. Because I have to look at it as we spend money, we get money in, these things balance, and I cannot do that. And these are large amounts we're talking about. So if we could, if I could just ask that for the next cycle, not right now, but um, want to make sure that we understand we did get some general fund revenues 
And you're saying they are in the other revenue figure, the one and a half million? Yes, I can, I can, I can confirm that if it's in this um, close. Yes, if it's here, it is going to be in the other revenues because we don't have a okay. specific line item that says, we don't have an account that says, reimbursable for this particular event. So we have to have them into revi other revenues and then we take them from there and put them where they need to okay. be. Yeah. But so if it's not there, does that mean we have an extra million and a half dollars? That's what I'm if asking. If it's not there, that means it's not in this particular, when we close, this is the first quarter, remember? This is right. the first okay. quarter of September. So if it's not in September, that doesn't mean it's not in, in the August, September, uh, August, September close. It, it might be in the other months. Okay. You're yeah. So what I need to know by tomorrow night is, is it included or not? Okay. okay. Do we have another million and a half dollars? Okay. That's, that's the basis of my question. Um, the next, I had a couple more measure P type questions of things in the budget and whether or not they could be funded by measure P, which I realize is also general fund. One thing I noticed in the general fund budget was for um, youth spirit artwork, $78,000. Is that fundable through Measure P, and why is it showing up outside of the context of Measure P, Mr. Wallace? I I, I believe that that was moved to fiscal year twenty one, so that's when you see the line item of one seventeen. But I'll let Mr. Wallace answer that. Okay, uh, it's listed there um, because Measure P is general fund, but I believe there was a note in that that said the seventy eight thousand was allocated through Measure P. That's where it would be spent. We're just carrying it forward because we didn't spend it in the current year. So because it is quote unquote general fund, it's an O one O code. We're asking for it to be carried forward, but we haven't noted that that's a Measure P expense. Okay. And the same thing with the, uh, there was one other of these, I'm going to find the downtown street team expansion. Is that the same? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So for the new fiscal year, we've created, I believe, Henry, a measure P and a measure U actual fund code. So in future years, those would be carried over in measure P and in measure one. Okay. But for the last fiscal year, they were still coded as general fund. So that's why they're listed there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, you know, I've been on this committee four days. So if I've asked something that no, no, it's four apologies, but I am doing a lot of reading <laughs> just to get No, I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem at all. No, thank you. Okay. Um, then let's go back to the overtime discussion. Um, I am not willing to allocate $5 million and I'll tell you a few reasons why. Uh, first of all, I agree with the comments made by the public that these numbers that we're looking at for current expenditures assumed assume no increased oversight of police overtime by city administration and no change in functions carried out by the police. And I want to say again, the police department, many of these funds have always been spent. It's not that we're suddenly spending bunches of more money, but we have not done an adequate job of accounting for them and overseeing their use particularly in the area of regular overtime, which is provided both to patrol officers, but also managers, I'm very concerned about this enormous increase that happened in the 2020 year. Again, we went from, a, we added 10,000 hours of regular overtime to the patrol division, I believe, and at the average officer rate times time and a half, that's a million dollars right there in one year that we added. And I, I don't see an explanation for that because our staffing levels had gone back up. We may be struggling a bit now, but our staffing numbers had gone back up. And that number, that million dollars, one million and twelve thousand dollars, is based on an officer salary. And we know there's a lot of lieutenants and sergeants in there, so the number is actually bigger than that. Um, and again, the idea that overtime is being overspent because of understaffing is not accurate. We see that in 18, when we had low staffing, almost all of the money needed to pay the overtime came out of the department budget because they were saving salary money because they didn't have enough people. Now, almost all the overtime that's being spent that's over their budget comes from other departments. What does that mean? What that means is that the things that we put aside, all this work we just did talking about measure P, the work we do talking about how do we how do we fund programs for our citizens? How do we fund roads? How do we make sure that people are housed, that are homeless? In, in some ways, ends up being less meaningful because what we vote for doesn't happen because the accounting department is known they have to hold on to money for the police department because they're gonna overspend. And we've been doing that for years. So what we budget is not real. 
in, in a fundamental sense, I'm very concerned about that. And again, I don't blame the police department so much about of that. I think it's a strange practice we've fallen into that assuming we're gonna make this up somehow. But the reality is $5 million a year. Imagine what you could do with that. We could pave 50% more streets than we're doing right now under T1 for the next $5 million. We can provide housing subsidies to 200% more homeless people than we are right now. And remember, housing homeless people benefits us as well as them. I don't want people living on my block. I'm sure none of you do. And I want to be compassionate, but it benefits me too when they get a subsidy and they move. So this is not a program for the poor. It's a program for all of us. So $5 million a year, just think of those numbers. We know the police department budget has grown from $30 million in 2002 to $80 million in 2020, while all other departments have flatlined. And I wish I could show you this chart, but I can promise you, I've looked at these numbers, the general fund budget for all other departments has remained essentially flat. And that means there are tons of services we can't do. There are things we are not able to accomplish that the public expects us to do. And that they vote for measures to pay for. They vote for these things. And we say, yeah, we're going to do that. And then we give the money to the police department. There's a problem with that um, approach. We also know, as I said, this that in addition to 20 being an anomalous year, we generally have not reviewed how we use police overtime. And it's an enormous amount of money. Um, so we're doing an audit right now. The auditor is doing a police audit, looking at how practices work. I want to point out one example. For example, the police department spent um, in, I think this is just, there's a lot of great tables, David. So it's taking me a while to parse. But the police department spent $559,000 in 20 for police under strength, which I believe means we needed to make up for lack of staff. In 18, when they were at their historic low, they spent $255,000 on that. Um, they've spent about $300,000 a year on what they call shift extensions, which is looking at, I'm going, you know, my shift extended because it was a crime in progress and I had to stay with it, which is fine, but it also means writing my report. It also means doing things on overtime. And those practices have not been examined. So I'm just gonna go back to my example of 2020 and why it's a bad year and say that I cannot fund this at this full $5 million or feel good about voting for that. We do need to fund and recognize the money will come in for reimbursable services. We have to be realistic about that. We do have to be realistic about the fact these numbers have never been adjusted for salaries which is sad and I'm sorry that didn't happen. I think if we'd kept up over time, we would have seen the total cost of the police department and we would have had a more uh, reasonable discussion about it. But we need to make these adjustments now and I appreciate the effort to make this budget reflect more of, more of reality. But this extra million dollars that was spent in 2020 on extra patrol staff, even though we were higher staffing, concerns me. The fact that we have an increase in the staffing complement in several of our other non-patrol bureaus, but none of that's been reflected here, concerns me. The fact that we have brass, essentially lieutenants, making overtime, it is true. The FMLA decision requires that we pay overtime when we require them to work overtime, but it doesn't say you have to work overtime. I'm sorry to say this, but I see a pattern where until last year when it became seven, six point, $7.6 million, every year the amount was spent with $6.2 million, whether we had 155 officers or 170 officers. People are working to these numbers, and that is not the way to run a railroad. We need to have the overtime reconciled. So what I would like to propose on the mayor's budget as an alternative to this is, first of all, we not fund at least about a million and a half of this, which is made up of the million dollars that was extra in 2020. The um, amount we're spending on some of these other bureaus, when we take those other bureaus and we use the average overtime cost again for the three years, and we don't recognize that those were low years and they've hired now, we're building in more money than is needed. And that we also make some other reductions and reduce this budget at least by a million and a half dollars. 
I'd also like to propose that of the remaining amount, we put a million dollars in reserve and ask the department, as we're looking at reinventing public safety, do we mean it or not? Let's be frank, do we mean this? Are we really looking at how we do policing or are we just saying that? If we're really looking at that, we should be coming back and saying, how can this money best be used? Do we really mean that we're asking the auditor to do a budget audit of the police department or are we gonna blow that off? She's gonna be done with that in the spring. Do we really mean it when we say we just expect general management of things like your schedules, your shift extensions, et cetera, or do we not mean it? The way to know for me that we mean it is we put some of this money in reserve. I asked Mr. White at our last meeting, again, I've been here four days, at our last meeting whether or not there was a way to do reserves and I don't think I heard back from him but I think it's important that we set aside this money and demand the police department come back to us and administration. It's not just the police. I wanna be really fair to them. They've eaten a lot of costs and never had them reflected in their budget. That everybody come back to us and explain how this money is being spent. And then we do this quarterly. I know it's terrible. I know it's tedious, but Mr. White is on the brink of doing a lot of really good investigation. And to just say, oh, well, let's use the averages, even though he's doing all this work, I think is a travesty. It would be a gift to public funds. So what I'm recommending is we allocate an additional two and a half million that we cut one and a half million of it and then we put the remaining one million in reserves. So that would be my recommendation. I would then feel like we have a slightly bigger cushion. I don't like being 14,000 to the negative in this huge budget. Um, if we had more money, I would like to put it in 115 trust. And let me just say one thing about that. Over half the pension obligation that we have in the 115 trust is for the police department. It's for our police employees. This benefits them to get this, this fund stabilized because when it's not stable, what happens is we take money out of their general fund budget every year to reflect the extra amount we have to put into pensions to keep that fund stabilized. We've been paying down that obligation through this investment in the 115 trust with the hope that it would keep our general fund numbers low. In other words, when we owe more money to CalPERS or to our uh, pension funds in general, it's not like the money just appears. It comes from the department. They get charged an amount for that. That's money that we need to get to a point where the police department budget isn't at risk of being suddenly hit with these huge pension obligations. So I believe the 115 trust benefits their department almost more than anybody else because they're 50% of the budget and that it's a worthy investment. But I'm not sure we're at a point right now where we can do that. But anyway, that's my, that's my proposal, Mr. Mayor. And um, thank you for Thinking up on my comments some time ago about the $14,000 in parking, I hope um, Councilman Drossi, that's acceptable to you. I think, I feel like my merchants are all suffering. They can't park. They feel so stressed by COVID and they, this would just give them a little benefit, easy employee parking in the lot while it's not being used. So I hope we can do that. And I'd like to do that. I'd like to also ask um, Mr. White and Mr. Uh, Garland to look at the financial and operational um, possibilities of doing that in the Civic Center garage as well and come back to us at, you know, at a future date with how we might do that. Because my merchants are having the same problem. They just, they can't park, they're stressed, their stores are being broken into, the streets are terrible and they feel awful. We need to do what we can for these stores and these merchants. They're just struggling so, so, so much. So anyway, that's what I'm proposing. So I wouldn't change any of the other numbers on here except making that one number two and a half million with a million dollar reserve. Thank you for letting me go on at length. Thank you. Um, all right, so I, I have some questions um, and, and Mr. Mayor and Councilmember, well, Mr. Mayor, first, let me thank you for putting so much time and energy into this proposal. And thank you staff for um, providing us with lots of information. I know I asked dozens of questions over the weekend and Councilmember Harrison, thank you for um, your thorough dive into um, police overtime. So I guess I wanna first um, talk about uh, those potential um, savings from the mayor's proposal. And, and first, let me just say, I'm, I thank you for putting the Elmwood uh, lot in there. Of course, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, you know, so, so my concern is um, is again sort of the the health of the Measure P fund, and you're right in that 
we do have a, a positive ending balance. Um, so I guess I, I just initially have some questions around um, the, the, the line items, which say um, the flex fund included in the homeless response team above. So you mean that's, um, that $15,000 looks like it's in addition to the 815, am I? Am, am I missing something? Oh, you're on mute, Jesse. I need to pull up the AAO because it's in there, but I know staff can. Okay, so I can answer that one. This is Paul, if you want. Sure. Yeah, so that you're right. That is that is included in the AAO ask and is over the is above the eight hundred um, yeah. amount. Okay. And then so and and I also feel like um, I, I got different information around the 805 set aside for COVID homelessness solutions. I, you know, I was excited to, to remember that we had, um, you know, we had set that aside. But then um, in my conversations with or my communications with David White yesterday, it sounded like that 805 um, was going to be needed for uh, the city hall, uh, old city hall expanded shelter. And so um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just confused about that. So if you could, if you could pull up um, the November 12th measure P spreadsheet, um, from that excess equity, that might be that might be helpful. Okay, thank you. And then, so if you could scroll down a tiny, just a tiny bit, perfect, right there. And um, so, in in looking at, actually, sorry to micromanage the scroll, but can you bring it as as far down as possible so there's not no no bring it the other way so we can see the revenues coming in but still see the bottom line at the bottom up a tiny bit more <laughs> no other way other way oh, sorry <laughs> there uh, okay i mean that's perfect right there good okay um so if we look at the um you know we have uh potentially in fiscal year 22 an ending fund balance of a negative three million and we're putting additional expenditures um, for fiscal year 21, you know, just as the mayor mentioned, we, we have to address this. And so if we're going to be adding whatever th those line items are, I guess I, and it sounds like you are unable to answer this question now, but I, I had the exact same question that the mayor had in that, is there anything that we have planned for fiscal year 21 that we don't have a contract signed on or we don't have like a, you know, we're not in process that we can pause for a few months so we can get those additional allocations in the mayor's spreadsheet in there and not be facing um, sort of a catastrophic shortfall in the subsequent years. Again, I recognize the ending fund balance is strong and but I also want to point out that um, we don't know what the revenues are going to be and hopefully they will be more than 4.7 million um, but my my concern is it would be you know especially if we're going to be embarking on new programs that it it doesn't it doesn't make sense to do that because we're not going to have the money to do it so that's just my concern, and I don't think we can solve that today. But what I would like to do in when you consider the 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 whatever we vote on today, the mayor's proposal is looking at those Measure P twenty one allocations. Is there is there any way that we can fund it elsewhere or? put a pause on something that's not in process until we get a 
a bigger picture of what our needs are going to be. Because if we look at these fiscal year 22 through 24, um, and, a grant, and granted, those are estimates. Even if we take out sort of the big ticket items, we still have a, a big problem on our hands. So I would just ask that, um, that we provide staff with some flexibility to look at how we accommodate what the mayor put forward with additional measure P um, coverage and you know, with an eye to have some flexibility around, around these measure P line items. So that's just it, just something I'm I'm thinking about. I'm sure it comes as no surprise that I'm you know I've been concerned around um, the measure P allocations, but I, I would just ask for that flexibility so we can, at some point next year in the next few months, and I don't know if that would be bounce it back to the panel of experts, send it to the the health enrichment committee or whatever that we need to we need to figure this out. This is really important for all of these, you know, all of these um, recipients to know what their future looks like, or, you know, whether the city should continue on a certain path. So um, I would just ask for that sort of flexibility and looking at measure P when staff comes back to us in the next um, 24 hours or however many, 20, yeah, something like that. Um, and then going to, um, um, going to uh, the uh, the police overtime. Um, actually, before I do that, I um, I do want to speak uh, on behalf of those fire positions. Um, you know, and I think the mayor has made that clear that he also wants to make sure that that we uh, and, and Kate that we want to make sure those fire positions are in there. Um, and I also just really want to make a plug for our communications po uh, positions as well. I know um, they've been working overtime uh, to try to communicate to the public our, our varying health orders. And so I don't know, you know, I just want to make sure that whatever council passes on Tuesday that we are going to be able to have um, that that we can help out our communications department in some way because I I feel like that is actually a really over and all our departments have needs but that's one area I know it's very small um, you know few individuals working on that and it's really important um, to communicate effectively to our public so I'm not sure you know, how, how to address that. Um, so in terms of, of the police overtime, I, I, you know, I basically just have a question. I don't know if it's for um, David D or Andy. Um, <clears throat> what would be the implications if we do not pay the $5 million in police overtime? So I, um, you know, I just want to, I, I just want to say it, it. It seems like, I, and, and certainly this has been um, my take, is that there hasn't been a mismanagement of the of um, police overtime. It's more that we just haven't set the budget at a level that can sustain the demands. And I really appreciate all the work you've done. It seems like the the two big areas are around patrol and um, special events and um, but but correct me if I'm I'm wrong if we if we don't address the this police overtime number I, I mean if we if if we reduce it I mean it seems like we can't reduce detectives pay you know it's not like we can stop people from investigating a a, a crime. Uh, it, it sounds like, you know, we, we don't want to be in violation of contracts. And I just want to make sure that we can effectively respond to the demands of our community. I know that the public safety, the, the power outages have, um, for instance, that's a huge reason. That's one of the big reasons why overtime numbers are 
are greater because of these sort of unexpected events like the, the PG&E shutoffs. And so I, I'm just wondering, just a general question, if this is something we're gonna consider, if, um, if we don't pay, what are the ramifications if we, if we don't pay that full $5 million um, for police overtime? Since this is, it seems like it's going to be a conversation piece. So I'm not sure who can, who can take that. If it's you know D, Andy, David, um, I, I'm just curious if if this is going to be sort of the, the the lightning rod discussion point. We need to know what that will, what that will entail. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I certainly will defer to the chief um, on this as well. But um, we did highlight in the report some of the impacts that would occur if um, if this overtime is not funded. But um, I'll defer to the chief to give a more comprehensive kind of statement on what happens. And, and you're right, there are, there are mandated functions that the police department provides on a regular reoccurring basis that cannot be removed. Um, and then there are MOU obligatory um, obligations that we have to pursue as well that cannot be removed. We, they're baked in. Um, I do believe how we use um, our, our staffing has been something that we have been working on and addressing regularly. There are so many special, special things that are asked of the police department. Um, everything from holiday staffing um, in our downtown to staffing up for some of the issues that we've had in our telegraph um, district. Um, there are just so many small pieces that come out that equal big dollars. So I don't want it to, I, I, want, I agree with you and I thank you for your comments. I do not believe that we have mismanaged. I do believe that we, at some point, me, my predecessors and others should have reset and set up exactly what a true overtime budget should have been. And this goes years back. Um, so all of us, my predecessors, me and, and moving forward, we certainly need to reset our baseline, but I do want to defer to the chief to go over what would be the impacts of not funding this $5 million. So chief. So the, the, uh, <clears throat> the impacts of not funding, of course, it's a sort of a scale just depending on what the funding is. And it's somewhat difficult um, to um, lay out with um, uh, to lay out with a specificity, extreme specificity or certainty. The way that we um, uh, have to reduce uh, overtime costs um, if, if or as staffing drops and we need to keep our continual operations, the continuously running operations up, um, typically is uh, some strategy that involves pulling our personnel uh, from other special assignments in some configuration. So either drawing down on them uh, temporarily cycling them through uh, or closing down the unit completely, uh, which is uh, where, we, where we were in 2018, bringing down, um, you know, having to close out um, or, or really significantly reduce the uh, staff on special assignments. So uh, that's, that's an approach that uh, we would have to take, which is if we have to keep, you know, not if, but keeping our, our beats staffed and our supervisors and command in place um, drawing from other resources. And that means, um, you know, negatively affecting the work that they're doing because everyone is doing, uh, is doing an important job uh, in their baseline work, whether it's Community Services Bureau, um, our motorcycle and traffic unit, um, <clears throat> or the bike, uh, the bike patrol, which we just recently rebuilt and restored after it kind of uh, over the years succumbed to um, staffing and budget um, pressures. Um, so inevitably, we are going to be in a position where we will be reducing some level of services. That said, um, I think it is, you know, I actually look forward to, very much look forward to um, um, budget for our overtime that uh, utilizes the, our actuals, you know, that uses um, the data from the previous few years. Um, 20, fiscal 20 was a unique year in terms of expense for a variety of reasons. I think that the um, um, so long as we don't have a long-term really intense protests and demonstrations and or disasters that we need to deal with, um, or for example, PSPSs or a series of them, it's those unforeseen events can have, can have a significant cost and they're challenging to budget for. I think over time, things like shift extension um, are, um, 
I think we can look at the use of that over the, over the years and, um, and count on the fact that, or sort of count on that we can make an estimation of what we need based on previous years. Shift extension is both patrol, meaning patrol officers have to finish their work uh, so that cases get completed and done, written and reviewed and so forth. Um, and shift extensions also um, are, uh, overtime is expended for our detectives whose cases may not fit within the confines of a business day. Uh, we may have a warrant out for somebody who gets arrested by another agency. Detectives need to come in early, go and get that person, interview them, write the report, and, and so on and so on. They're, you know, their work is complex. And so um, that's an area that I think we can look at in terms of um, saying it's, we're going to need we're going to need to fund that because um, we don't have the option of not doing the work often. Um, I think, as we've mentioned uh, now a couple of times in this um, to this committee, I think understanding the um, the uh, understrength uh, and the coding to make sure that uh, we've properly coded, or to, what we're going to do is look at how that's been coded to make sure that we're um, we're coding that appropriately will also help give us better information upon which to make decisions. Um, but one of the challenges. Uh, and sort of fundamentally, I think a, um, an approach which has a reserve um, or the consideration that in, in a given year outside of our control, um, there could be large events with which we are expected to manage uh, and address. And so we have to keep that in mind as well. Thank you. So, okay, let me see if I understand this correctly. So the, the impacts of not funding the full amount, according to you, is, is that there could be a potential of closing down special assignments. And by special assignments, you mean bike units. I mean, I can't imagine that homicide. <laughs> I, hom I, 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 I understand what you're saying about detectives, not like at some point, detectives are going to have to work overtime. But the special assignments that may need to be folded down, you're talking bike unit. I know other special assignments are um, the crimes against children, sexual assault crimes, traffic well, enforcement, community well, services, that kind of stuff. And well, then the, how would you choose that? The big, but well, we, I think we would look at what strategy we have. Um, it really depends on the unit. The, the, the places we would normally go or look at are um, bike patrol, uh, the community services bureau, traffic and detective division. Those, those buckets um, are where our special assignments are. And as to um, how we would address uh, the need. I think it depends on what the need is. Uh, the greater the reduction, the greater the impact. Um, in the past, we have uh, done temporary uh, temporary transfers or have people um, temporarily swing into patrol uh, and work a shift or shifts uh, in order to reduce the overtime. We would be looking at what, uh, I mean, I don't have a hard and fast answer. We would be looking at uh, what needs to be filled and how we could do it in a way and still uh, provide the best service possible. But it would be an impact on someone's work, baseline work. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I guess what I, um, since we've been meeting for, gosh, over two hours now, um, you know, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to make a motion to consider the, uh, to send to, to staff um, the mayor's proposal um, and to, um, And to allow um, some flexibility in looking at um, those Measure P funds per the mayor's um, suggestion, and also looking at our um, our if we have any potential savings. Um, so, for instance, I know the Stair Center has a 2.2 million dollar uh, price tag. I'm just curious whether whether that is um, because we've had to what do you call it? We've had to um, not have as many people at the stair center, whether that number would be, um, if we could save any money there. So some flexibility in looking at, at measure P and frankly, measure, measure U1 as well. I know some positions uh, have, um, you know, we, we've had the CARES Act able to take care of some uh, staffing, I think within U1. 
but just to allow staff some flexibility to look at measure P, U1, um, look, at, look at the mayor's proposal, um, address, uh, you know, and address the concerns to consider the concerns by both um, what I brought up and Council Member Harrison has brought up um, to consider um, to consider the comments that we've provided here today. Um, I'm not ready, you know, I can't vote on anything specific, any specific dollar amount, um, but I would just like to move the mayor's motion uh, or the mayor's proposal um, and uh, with, with those additional requests to allow some flexibility in looking at the measure P additions that he suggested along with the previous um, measure P um, allocations that have not been that have not been expended or promised um, or in process, I should say, and um, to uh, to address the police overtime up to uh, five million dollars. So that way we can fold in Councilmember Harrison's concerns as well, um, and have staff come back to us uh, on December fifteenth with a recommended funding plan. Um, I'll second that with um, two additions um, that we also request that the city manager return to council on December 15th with a recommended funding plan. So that's clearly part of the direction. Um, and I, I would like to, I, I, Councilor Harrison, I don't know if you wrote up your proposal or you're just sort of, you were just kind of presenting it verbally, but I would like for that to be presented to the council. I'm not going to be put, no, I'm not going to be put in a position of always being the person who read all these documents. I have to say, I'm very frustrated. I'll get, when I get to my comments, I did not write it up. I was hoping we could talk about the actuality of the numbers and not a yes or no question. So I did not write it up. I was hoping for a discussion of it. Thank you. Okay, well, anyways, I, I, I second the motion with that with that addition. I, I was trying to be helpful, Councilman Harrison. Uh, with that addition, um, that the manager returned to council with the funding plan, and I, I do think what you know, what she has presented should be certainly further explored. Um, so I think that should be part of the direction as well. Okay. Uh, all right. I have my hand up. Sorry, I did. Yes, Councilmember Harrison. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to say I, I do think it's really important that everybody recognize that a lot of this has been just paid for from somewhere else. And what I'm trying to do is say yes. It's not an all or nothing question. Asking a department head, what would you do without the 5 million is not the question. The question is what's the right number? We cannot give away $5 million without doing this work ourselves. That's our job in this charter. I don't even know what else to say about it. I feel like just saying to a department, well, what do you think? What do you think they're gonna say? This is kind of like theater and not real. I'm really concerned that we're not focusing on the numbers as presented. Special events are coded separately. What I'm talking about is regular overtime. That's what it's called. It's an acceptance that we're always going to work regular overtime. And that, in fact, in 2020, we're going to do a million dollars more of that. Is that really what we want to say as a message? I just can't vote for this. I think we are just saying, oh, well, we're just, we can't figure it out. I think we can figure it out. And I think it's okay that the chief has to come back to us on a quarterly basis and explain what's going on. We'd already voted in July for a quarterly report on overtime, which we did not receive. And we're now finally getting really good information. And what we're just saying is we're not responsible for the fiscal state of the city. I, I don't accept that. And again, I think two and a half million of this is completely makes sense because it's just never been recorded correctly in their budget. A million doesn't make sense at all. And the other million, I just don't know what the answer is, which is why I wanted to kind of reserve it because I don't know what's causing that. And that may be in the land of, could we do better on scheduling and things like that. So some of this is work practices, but some of it is just, we spent a heck of a lot of money in 2020 and we're using that figure. And I just, I don't see the logic of that at all. So I'm sorry, I cannot vote for this. Um, Okay. That's half the roads that we could do more 50% more roads and 200% more homeless people we could house. That's what we're deciding. Well, Madam Chair. So hang on one second. So um, 
So first of all, you know, I just would say that, you know, I also disagree with the assessment that we're shirking our financial, our financial duties um, in that. And I also want to point out that they use median, they use median levels. Um, and so we've received, you know, I think a pretty, a much better analysis than we've received in the past. Um, and I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable to ask them to consider your uh, proposal up to $5 million. So I, we were trying, you know, I was trying to incorporate your, your concerns and, um, you know, whether we disagree or not, I don't think that really. I can do up to four. I cannot do up to five. Okay. I can show you specifically. I it's have not a special event. Hang on. I have four. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that allowing that, um, which I think is a, um, a good, compromise to see what staff brings to us right we're not saying we're not saying absolutely have to do the five million dollars bring to us a proposal um and be prepared to explain to council so i i i think that's that's reasonable and and if you you know you have a different opinion that doesn't mean that we're um we're shirking our our financial duties and we've all spent time looking into this um mr mayor you had your you wanted to comment yeah, um, you know, we're not recommending any any allocations today because staff needs to do some additional analysis and present a funding plan. Um, so we're not ready to recommend my proposal, your proposal. I'll just say for the record that I'm very open to your proposal and that, we're, you know, that we're going to discuss this at the full council. I do agree with many of the concerns you've expressed around managing overtime and my and I just have a, a point of clarification. My understanding of what you proposed was two and a half million direct allocation as part of this AAO for overtime now, and that a million, it was at 500,000 or was it a million be put into a reserve fund that could be accessed, a million that could be accessed right. for um, additional overtime costs as, as needed. Right, and, and as the assessments are done by the auditor and the deputy city manager, because they're in the middle of this work. I mean, I think they would be would, first to bet. Who would make the decision about accessing the overtime? They manager. would come back to us and ask for us to allocate the money. The I don't council? know how reserves, yeah, I don't know how reserves work in Berkeley. That's what we would do in other cities I've worked in. But I don't know how they work here. I asked Mr. White that question. I'm not sure how we do that here. Um, and then, uh, so that leaves about one and a half million that mm -hmm. that would be available for reallocation. What are you Correct. where are you proposing that go? I would propose that that go into the one fifteen trust. I think it's our responsibility to get those numbers down. We we know we have this huge unfunded liability, and and again, about half of it is police, no fault of their own. This is just what's happened with these funds. So I think it's an important thing that we not give up on that. And it's, or if the city manager has other suggestions for putting it in reserves, that's fine. And in a way, the 115 is a reserve. So whether we put it in reserves or we put it in the 115, we're reserving money and saving money in the long run. Okay. Um, that, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so, you know, I would like the council to consider this um, as part of the, the, the budget discussion tomorrow. Um, I think it's fair. I think I think I expect that this will be the big the big ticket discussion um, tomorrow, um, as we're pretty close to balancing on everything else. Um, uh, you know, I, I am concerned about operational impacts and like things like the downtown task force being suspended. Um, but at the same time, I do think we need to manage better manage over time. And I, I think the analysis the staff has provided us has been really great. And um, I think it's been, I think it's some of the most complete information I've gotten on police over time in my 12 years on the city council. And um, I think part of whatever we decide to do on this overtime question, I think fundamentally what we need to talk about is a process in which we're going to properly account for and, and as well manage overtime costs prospectively as well. So I think that's got to be part of the conversation um, going forward, um, uh, you know, even after this fiscal year. So I, I think this has helped shed some light on a, an important issue that I think is that we need to further work, further address. Um, so we're just sending things along. We're not, 
we're not ap approving any particular recommendation. I appreciate the chair's flexibility to, you know, to ensure that you're that the issues you're raising are under consideration by the city manager. Thank you. Right. I, I failed to say this before. I do appreciate your points on Measure P. I think that's something we have. Oh. I'll, I'll recognize you. Sorry. Now, I was just going to say, I, I failed to say before, I, I appreciate your points on Measure P. I think that is something we have to be looking at. But the laser eye that we apply to that is the same laser eye we need to apply to the general fund for our department. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, good. It, it sounds like we have a motion. Um, so again, um, to, uh, to come back with a funding plan, um, to consider uh, the suggestions brought forward by Councilmember Harrison up to uh, up to five million dollars um, to allow you know to look at our Measure P um, planned but not realized expenditures, um, especially if we're going to be adding on to that um, adding on to those commitments. And was there something was there something else, Mr. Mayor? Um, that the manager present a, a funding, a funding plan. Uh -huh. um, was that was that clearly? Yeah, stated? That, yeah, I, I believe so. Um, <clears throat> and um, and then just to reiterate our, um, hopefully our commitment to um, the, the fire positions and communications positions. Um, should that be part of the motion? It's in it's in the it's in my budget proposal, so that's fair. Okay, um, that's true, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm just particularly worried about communications. Um, all right, so um, okay, so that uh, that is the motion, and then of course, you know, I, I think it goes without saying that we should include since we have number three here. I propose the also that is reflected in the mayor's budget, a 20% reserve replenishment. Um, I don't think it makes sense to dip below 20%. Um, of course, I think it should go without saying also in the mayor's proposal, you know, sad, sadly having to take a, a holiday on some of those contributions to the trust and um, and, and in that 9.1, um, but that's all reflected in the mayor's proposal. So that'll be the motion. Mayor, did you second that? I did. And I just want to just check with the city manager that that is um, clear and is, and is that helpful? <laughs> Not clear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very clear direction. Um, thank you so much for all of the input today. And we certainly will bring back a funding plan um, with consideration of both the overtime requests um, from Councilmember Harrison as well as the mayor's proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so clerk, will you call the roll? Yes, Councilmember Harrison. Abstain because I don't understand the how we're going to get the information back. I guess could, could I just point of clarification? Understand how we're getting that back? It's going to come to us in the form of a memo tomorrow, or what's what are we looking for? I, I imagine they're going to walk in a, a proposal um, to council, or if they can get it to us. Um, ahead of time, even better. But um, I imagine it'll be a, 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 a walk. But um, Madam City Manager, do you have any, um, any, well, actually, why don't we do this? Why don't we finish, <laughs> Thank why you, don't finish calling the roll? Okay. Or actually, no, that actually, that will help you with your, you already abstained though, right, Councilman yeah. Harrison? Well, I, I'm abstaining only because I don't understand the process and how it's going to work. Okay, so then why don't we clarify the process and then hold on the roll? So, um, Madam City Manager, what? Um, when do you think are you going to walk it into council? Or are you going to be able to send it to us um, ahead of time? Um, we will bring the proposal directly to council, and we'll get it to you all as soon as possible. But we will be walking it in to the council. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, so um, let's rewind on the roll call, Councilmember Harrison. I'm still gonna abstain. I think that number's too big. Okay. Um, okay, so Councilmember Harrison is still abstaining. Mm -hmm. All right, Mayor Aragine. Yes. And Councilmember Drosty. 
Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, one other thing that I just want to note, I did hear from Council Member Hahn about the, um, the last agenda item. I have so many tabs open, I don't see the title of it. But Council Member Hahn confirmed to me what Council Member Harrison said the last meeting um, that, that um, she would like that item to be pulled. Um, and let me see specifically. Um, I make a motion to receive the item and take no action um, as the concepts of maximum repayment of the reserves. Um, well, actually, let's just receive the item and take no action. That's my question. I, I second. Okay. Um, April, will you call the roll? Sure. Council Member Harrison? Uh, yes. Mayor Ergin? Yes. And Council Member Drosty? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, let's. That should do it. <laughs> Is there anything I don't want? I don't want to do anymore. I doubt you all either. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that about covers it. Um, Madam City Manager, do you have anything else to add? No, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right, uh, April, will you call the roll, please? Council Member Harrison? Uh, yes. Mayor Ergin? Yes. And Council Member Drosty? Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you.